Well, as uh, Pastor has already said, I'll, I'll give you a little update on AFCM and some of the things that are happening uh, before we get into the uh, word that I believe that the Lord have us uh, have me share this morning. Uh, first of all, I want to uh, thank you as a congregation and Pastor Carl for making your facility available for us to be able to have this meeting here today. We appreciate that very much and all of the food that's out there too. Seems like when you get around Pastor Carl, there's no shortage of food. <laughs> And I think it's just one of those things to make sure that we're disciplined so we don't overeat or something puts it in front of us. I've been sowing food. I'm never going to go hungry. <laughs> okay. So it's always, uh, always look forward to coming to Dallas and, and with the ministers that are down here, Pastor Don and everybody else. So praise the Lord. As a, a good way to kind of uh, close out the year, we usually take December to kind of wrap up things and get ready for 2015. Uh, usually the churches have plenty going on in the month of December anyway. But that started years ago when uh, that was the time that my children would be home for Christmas vacation. And I traveled, uh, I averaged about three weeks a month, 11 months of the year. Uh, I'd be overseas a month at a time, four times a year and all of that, and then come home and travel across the country. So trying to make, uh, you know, keep the priorities right. You know, we've got a wife and children, ministry, and of course family comes, you know, there's first it's God, then it's your family. I always looked at the family as uh, a miniature congregation. And I've always told my pastors through the years that uh, if you abuse your wife, you're going to abuse the congregation. <laughs> and uh, if you're taking care of your family, then more than likely you'll do the same with the family of God. You can't separate the two. Uh, you've, got to, you've got to be the same in the pulpit as you are at home. It's, it's just the way it is. Uh, there's no such thing as taking the vacation. I'll go to church on Sunday and then live like the devil during the week. It just doesn't work that way. Pastor is making that point this morning. You need, you need to make a commitment. Uh, it is like a marriage, and Jesus is our bridegroom. And when we're born again, um, it's 24-7, 365 days a year with him. Uh, we are his priests and kings. There, we, we never have a day off. We, that's 24-7. But anyway... So uh, we started uh, taking the month of December off so I could be around the, the children when they were on vacation. And then we just kept doing it after they got married and, and, her, and so forth. So anyway, that's a good way to close out the year. AFCM, uh, the Association of Faith Churches and Ministries, uh, it actually started back in 1979. I graduated from Rama in 1975. And at that time, there was no Rama ministerial. And uh, the, uh, when we graduated from Ramah in 75, we had to go find our own place to be ordained. Uh, Ramah was what the, an evangelistic association. So they didn't feel that uh, it was appropriate for them to ordain. There's a difference between a church ordaining you and an evangelistic association. So we had to find our own things. And of course, we were the first class. that 58 of us graduated. So there was not uh, what you'd call a lot of graduates out there to do churches. But I, uh, we started the church, uh, I mean, we took over a church of 12 people, and then we had a lot of home Bible studies all around there, and it ended up being North Dakota, South Dakota, Minnesota, and, Wisconsin, and uh, we, uh, all of a sudden, these churches just wanted, or prayer groups, rather, wanted to become churches. We found people to pastor them that uh, had read Brother Hagin's books or tapes that hadn't even gone to Ramah at that time, so, uh, most of them. And that's how it started, and then it just kept growing after that. So of the six years that we were up in Minnesota, we pastored five of those six, and uh, then we moved to Tulsa, and, and uh, that's when we uh, traveled full-time out of Tulsa for 17 years, just uh, working with the churches and working with pastors. Now, I never knew there was such a ministry, but after the first six churches were established, that's when the Lord spoke to me that that's what we would be doing. So... I had no idea how to do it. Just took it a day at a time and still don't really know what I'm doing. <laughs> Just trusting the greater one within me. And so that's how it all started. And it was, it was uh, without even realizing it, even before I knew this is what he called me to do. We were, we were getting together and fellowshipping uh, the few of us that there were. We, we got a hold of lawyers to come in and talk to us so that we could incorporate properly. Uh, accountants came in to help us set up the books and uh, we were actually doing it and we didn't even know that this was what you do. <laughs> and um, Christmas, uh, we'd get together at Christmas and have a special time together with our families. It was just good. And um, so that's the way it's kept on going. 
Then in uh, 19, let's see, that was, I think, 1985 then, if I remember right, I think that's when Ramus became a church, and they started RMAI, the uh, ministerial group. My wife and I went to Brother Hagen, and of course we felt we were an extension of the vision God gave him to take the word of faith to the world. And I understand the word of faith to be the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's nothing, you know, strange. And uh, so we said, well, now you've started RMAI, and of course we have AFCM, and uh, you know, maybe we, you know, if you want, you know, we can just merge the two together and you know, just get in behind you. And uh, so about a year or so later, uh, Brother Hagen and, uh, called my wife and I into the office and so there was Aretha and uh, Brother Hagen and, and uh, the bottom line was he says you know he says he says you can reach people that we can't reach and we can reach people you can't reach and so I think we need to work both sides of the fence so that's where we are so uh, they and of course that's the way it's worked and so for many years the uh, the Hagens would recommend uh, people to come over to AFCM because at that time they wouldn't uh, uh, grant ordination and licensing to people who had not graduated from RAMA. And so when people wanted to get uh, a certificates through RAMA and they had not gone to RAMA, then they were referred over to us. So we've been working together through the years and it's worked very well. And so recently we've reorganized. Uh, I wasn't paying, I don't know, you know, there's some things you just don't notice. It started with just me and my Bible traveling, preaching, and all of these things came about. And I, and I didn't catch it right away that really, uh, I've even said it, I feel like I'm pastoring a congregation, but my congregation scattered in different parts of the world. And, um, but uh, when it come to uh, what happened then, everything snowballed, it grew. The Bible schools that we have uh, started as video Bible schools and now they're DVDs and I don't know what all. And they're in different parts of the world. And pretty soon we were being overrun. Our staff was small. And then of course there was things going on that my staff was not anointed or equipped to do. And uh, we started sliding backwards, you know, with keeping up with things. And so then we took a good look at it several years ago. And I began to realize that this is really like a church. <laughs> and a pastor can't do everything in a church. I can't do everything. And uh, so now we've set it up like we used to have regional directors that were responsible for a whole region and of course our goal is to get to know people personally as much as we can I don't like just a computer list with people and so we encouraged our regionals to keep that personal contact with everybody and keep track of everybody well most of them are pastoring and it's really difficult for them to do both and so we begin to see that so now what we've done we've set up teams or like in a church they'd have uh, somebody over youth somebody over children you know you'd have your different departments we call them teams and uh, of course I have a leadership team that's made up of four of the regional directors and they help me and they communicate with all the regionals. But now each regional director is building a team and we pretty much have most all the regions now uh, uh, there's, uh, are, have their team anywhere from one to seven people. And uh, I'm temporarily regional director for the Gulf Coast from Louisiana to Florida. And uh, I have uh, six on my team and I have uh, uh, for example, a couple came to me and of course what we've done, we said, now look, yeah. and according to the Bible, you know, when you look at the body of Christ, every member does its share. And uh, so everybody's got gifts and anointings. It doesn't just uh, sit and watch the pastor try to do everything. There's things where the pastor is weak, where there's people in the congregation that are strong. They have different giftings and we don't, not one of us have the spirit without measure, but if we work together corporately, we do. And so then I began to put the word out several years ago that we, we need help. And uh, if we're going to be strong the way God wants us to be and accomplish what he's called us to do, then every member needs to do their part. And it's more than just, you know, tithes and offerings, obviously. And so this couple came to me, for example, and says, we have our own business. And, and uh, it's a family a construction company. And so uh, the man's wife and his two daughters work in the office. And says, we, the wife said, we just love to call people and talk to them. And we can do that in our office. We can, and so what he's done, he's given his, uh, the, the, the gentleman has given his wife and daughters uh, 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 like a half a day a week. And that's all they do is make phone calls for AFCM and let them know about meetings and stay in touch with them. And so that has been a tremendous load that came off because when I first got there, I was calling all the members or trying to contact them. 
That took a lot of time. <laughs> and then a lot of times pastors and ministers never answer the phone. It's real secret where they're at. And, uh, and they won't even answer the answering machine. So then I would, the second time I did that, I put a text behind it and still wasn't doing too well. And uh, so finally, we got a real good core now in Florida. And, uh, you know, we found out from each one individually, which is the best way to communicate with you, you know, by mail, e e you know, email, or telephone, or texting. And, of course, this couple now has worked it all out, and they took that whole load off of us. And so it's really, it's really, really re working good. So it's better to have several people in the region than just one person trying to do the whole thing. Then we also have the, the prayer team, which uh, uh, we have... Uh, uh, people that have a, a part of the team that have a network of intercessors all over the world and sometimes they're just you just need help <laughs> a lot of things you know you can stand on the word and hold fast to your confession but sometimes there's some pretty serious things that develop and and you really need all the help you can get and then we've had some tremendous answers to prayer real miracles since we put that together and then you know, of course everybody prays but there's just those there are those people that's just what they do all day long and, uh, but then we have the, uh, the Bible school, the educational team, and that was major. I mean, that's gotten to be, uh, well, there's just uh, 200 and some hours there. And, of course, they've looked at the whole school now. I don't know how many, several hundred hours this team has put into it already, evaluating all of the subjects, make sure that we're current. I, I myself, uh, are redoing some of the classes because some of them were taped in 98. And you know, and you get up here because we've learned a few more things since then. And so I've been retaping, others have, and uh, it's, a, it's a major task. And of course, the people who are heading up the team, uh, they used to work with a, a mega church and, uh, and run their Bible school. And, in, and the one that heads up the team also started a community, a community college from scratch and wow. got the thing organized and even registered with the state of Minnesota and, and the whole thing. And so they've got organizational skills that are over the top, you know, the two ladies that run it. Plus, they said, we'll do the team, but then we want our buddy to come with us. And she happens to have a Ph.D. in English, which is good. And, uh, of course, now there's several other people added to the team. That's taken a major load off of my office, what have you. So the, the, uh, the uh, AFCM, uh, last count I had, there was, we were approaching 100 people. I had already stepped forward and says, I can do this. Some of it's graphics and some of it's tight, you know, uh, tech stuff. And uh, it's just incredible. So I'll tell you, when everybody does their part, it's, it's, it's just not a burden. So it's, it's like AFCM, I've been telling people, is stronger and more alive than it's ever been. And, and, uh, and the relationships are really uh, getting close and stronger. So that's uh, kind of a brief update. And then I had the missions team. I wanted somebody on that team that actually lived in foreign countries. Because we didn't want our missionaries to fall through the crack. And that can happen. And somebody that can stay in touch with them. Well, the gentleman that I asked to do it, he and his wife, when I first met them in the 70s and, uh, in a full gospel business meeting in Montana, they started their ministry by going to Nepal. And when they got there, they had to learn the language. And they were up on top of a mountain and uh, no rain. They could get there in two days walking up those narrow paths. Three days if it was raining. And they lived there for around about five years. And then they came back to the States and I needed somebody in Siberia. <laughs> so he and his family went to Siberia for us. And um, then they came back and I needed somebody to pastor in, in uh, South Carolina. And he took that from me for 16 years. And so when I approached him last fall, he had come to find out they just never could get this out of their heart. Missions and traveling to foreign countries. And that he had already been in contact with all of our missionaries, had all the data on them. So he just stepped into it, Dana and Liz now. And so he has a team. And so as we're speaking right now, they just started their trip. Uh, well, they've already last year, they were over twice overseas since last October. Now this year, they are, they've already been to Thailand. They just left the Philippines and they've got Nepal and Sri Lanka and India ahead of them yet. And of the four of the five countries, they're actually in the process of registering with uh, AFCM, with the government so that uh, there's more things we can do if we can just move right in, you know, and work with the government. And uh, we have the Bible schools in all of these countries, and uh, the Philippines is just going wild. Well, it is, every, all five of them are. China already, we have that set up that all of the, chi the Chinese, actually, the national director and the regional directors are all Chinese. 
So we've got to, that's our goal in every country is to set it up so that the people in that country can uh, keep it going. If uh, we could never get back into that country again or no money could be sent to that country, of course we believe for all of the countries they believe, everybody needs to believe God. <laughs> but it's set up so that it'll keep going even if we never can get back into those countries. And so it's happening very, very fast right now. And uh, things are just opening up and praise the Lord. So anyway, that's a brief update. And my wife, of course, wanted me to extend greetings to you and her love. And uh, she's been here before. But uh, we've just, uh, we just come off the road with a <laughs> pretty grueling trip. <laughs> she loves to travel, but we, took the, uh, we decided to go with the car. And so we did five weeks. We covered 7,400 miles, you know, all the way to Oregon, California, and what have you. And she's still regrouping. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> but anyway, I've been running these marathons for so many years. It's uh, I feel out of place if I'm not moving. All right. So, any questions? Uh, that's what AFCM is. Pastors have already been covering it somewhat. You know, it's a covering, and and of course we like the fellowship, and of course for people to get to know each other. So. Approximately how many schools and how many churches? Well, there's several hundred of each, I guess, <laughs> at least. And uh, much more. In China, there's so many, they don't even know. Well, there's countries we have no clue. We've got members of AFCM that are apostles, and, and, and each of them have two, three hundred churches, but we don't count those. And uh, it's just, well, we're just, uh, Jesus is the head of the church. We just do what he tells us to do each day and let him take care of the numbers. We're not the largest uh, association that there is. You know, there's some huge ones out there. Uh, like, for example, Rama. You know, they got thousands of thousands of graduates. But you just have to, but what, what we need to do is whatever God entrusts you with, do it, take care of it. Whether it's a church of 15 people or a church of 15,000 or 150,000, whatever God's called you to do, do it. <laughs> take care of it. So we're just... Uh, we just believe that he'll bring to us whatever we can handle and whatever we're equipped to do and we'll just do it. <laughs> With his help, we can do it. Certainly can't do it in our own strength. Amen. All right, any other questions or comments? So, all right. Are you ready for the word? All right. A few of you are. Which side was that? Was that over here? <laughs> Okay, Father, we just come to the name of Jesus. We just thank you, Lord, for your presence. We just welcome you, Holy Spirit. And we certainly do look to you to help us this morning with what you've imparted in my heart that needs to be shared this morning. We just thank you in advance that you are our teacher. We thank you for revelation knowledge, spiritual understanding. We just thank you like you said in your word. We thank you this morning for filling us with the knowledge of your will, which is your word. And we just thank you for... Uh, helping us so we can have a walk worthy of you, be fruitful in every good work, fully please you in every way, increase in our knowledge of you, and we thank you for strengthening us with your glorious power, with all patience and long suffering, with joy. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. All right, well, um, I'll begin. Uh, let me just begin here in Matthew 26 and 28, and then I'll share with you where we're going. And here, of course, is the Passover and uh, with his disciples. But verse 28 says, For this is my blood, say my blood, my blood, of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Well, in my travels and uh, just those gathering just from the meeting last night, that everybody's pretty much up to speed on all the latest uh, deceptions and tricks of the devil. And uh, with all the false doctrine that's going through the body of Christ, it's, uh, uh, it's really difficult to keep up with all of it. Uh, it seems like the devil has taken every false doctrine that there is and he's thrown it all at the body of Christ at the same time. Yep. Right. It's just, uh, I mean, you can get overwhelmed if you look at it. But then I have to keep reminding myself that nothing's new, that this has been going on for 6,000 years at least. <laughs> The devil has been deceiving and deception and the Old Testament talks so much about false prophets and false shepherds and, and the punishment's really severe and all the people that have been deceived by all of these false leaders and on and on and on. So in that sense, nothing is new. But then in one sense, which Pastor Carl's already been talking about too, in some ways it is kind of new.
because now we don't have to go to a Christian bookstore or whatever, just take the USA Today or just take the headlines in the newspapers or what have you. The world is talking about one world order or one world government and one world religion. I mean, it's actually being put together right now. It's not something that's been prophesied and say in a thousand years it might come to pass or two. It is here. And we happen to be the generation that's here. <laughs> and so there's, uh, you know, um, uh, it's, uh, it's going to be a different day. Things are, I mean, it's really happening fast. And so for us, this generation, it's just not going to be like it used to be, I believe. And it's, and well, we just heard the little bit where a woman's arrested for mentioning the name of Jesus. In the, in the National Cathedral, which is supposedly a Christian place, <laughs> and all the things that are happening, and then you look and hear what's going on with the Christians in the, in, over there in Iraq and Syria, and, uh, you know, beheadings and crucifixions, and uh, this is getting, I mean, this is just like we've seen so much of it in the Old Testament nothing's really changed but it's really picked up in its intensity there's just uh, where's this all going well we know where it's going Jesus told us that as his return uh, draws near that uh, it was going to get worse on this earth that's just what he said and so we're beginning to see that so then as I watch and I've had a real close friend of mine and one who's worked for Brother Hagin for many years and said to me about two years ago or so he says, Jim, do you think this is the great apostasy or the, fall, the great falling away? Because we have so many ministers that are just, I mean, like committing adultery and embezzling and drinking. and You know, like, this is okay. God's forgiven us. And this is crazy. And uh, leading their whole congregations astray, making them think it's okay to live in sin. No big deal. Jesus already forgiven us. Well, Jesus shed his blood to set us free from the power of sin so we wouldn't have to sin. Amen. He didn't Amen. shed his blood so that we could continue to sin. That was not the name of the game. <laughs> he wanted us to be free and be able to have that intimate fellowship with him. So as I've looked at all of this, of course, I listen and I'm watching and, and some people are just in panic and some are in fear. And I even know some people personally... Uh, uh, and what have you, they're just figuring out all kinds of ways that we can avoid all of this. And, you know, uh, I mean, I know in the 70s, this has happened before, of course. In the 70s, we had all kinds of uh, people storing up food and then eventually their cans started rusting out. And so they'd pull all that out a few years later. And, but now all these things are coming around again. I'm telling you, there's only one way that we're going to make it through what's ahead of us and be able to finish the course that he set before us and that is to do exactly what the Bible says to do Amen. and when, when it comes right down to it it's it's all of the teachings or the basic doctrines of Christ everything that we have in our Bible which is divinely inspired nothing's changed God hasn't changed you know the 6,000 years sin is still sin the needs of people are still the same uh, and the devil is still the same. God's still the same. We just happen to be living, you know, in wearing different clothes perhaps or flying airplanes or driving these cars which they didn't have. But, but nothing, uh, nothing's changed as far as Satan, God, and people. We're still, there's greed, there's sin, and of course, God still desires for us to live holy lives and so forth. And so this is what's going to bring us through is the living word of God. So as I was looking at the scriptures, I, uh, you know, it's been a, since I've been here last night, I've been hearing the word covenant, you know. And of course, we just read there in Matthew 26, 28, this is my blood of the new covenant. And so when you go back here to Revelation 12 and 11, for example, and they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to the death. So here, of course, they're, uh, we know things are pretty rough as they're talking about here. But you know, it's only through the blood that we're going to make it. The blood of the Lamb. And I was reminded, it says, through the word of their testimony, they overcame it through the blood of the Lamb. Well, of course, that reminded me of Acts. And I get over here to Acts chapter 19. And you get down here to verse 11. How God worked unusual miracles with the hands of Paul. 
So that even handkerchiefs and aprons were brought from his body to the sick and the diseases left and the evil spirits went out from them. But verse 13, then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists took it upon themselves to call the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits saying, we exercise you by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. Also there were seven sons of Sevilla, a Jewish chief priest who did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, Paul I know, but who are you? And then of course the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them, overpowered them, and prevailed against them so, they could, so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. So they used the name of Jesus, but it didn't work. <laughs> they had no clue what was behind the name. Now when we talk about they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. You know, you hear Christians saying, and I used to, you know, uh, when I first got saved back in the 70s, I plead the blood. Matter of fact, we were, you know, we do how, what we call cleaning the house. We go into a, a, a home or into the motel room and we just plead the blood in the room. We just clean it out. Who knows what was sleeping in that bed before I got there and all of this. Well, you know, I had no clue what that meant. I plead the blood. Plead it over my car. You know, you can't even find that in the Bible that way. You would plead it over your car or anything. But there is the new blood covenant. And we do plead the blood of the new blood covenant. And that covers everything. Divine protection, supernatural provision and everything. But here we are now. They overcame him by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. Well, of course, the word of the testimony, the word of their confession. And Hebrews 3.1 talks about, therefore, holy brethren, consider the apostle and high priest, or the, uh, holy brethren, uh, <laughs> therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our confession, which that word confession literally means to con it's continuous and to say the same thing or to agree with. So we're to continuously agree with or say the same thing that God says about us, Amen. about who, what, who we are, what we've inherited, what our abilities are. And in this case here in this verse, we need to agree with God concerning the blood. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. What does that mean? You know, you can't have faith for something that you don't know. God, that's why God wants us to increase in our knowledge of him. Amen. You remember back there, uh, I was praying, you know, really. And you get down to Colossians 1, 9. And of course, and it says to be filled with the knowledge of his word. And then verse 10, with, uh, that we may have a walk worthy of him, fully please him, fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. Or Isaiah 5, 13, Hosea 4, 6, really both say, basically say the same thing. For lack of knowledge. My people perish. Lack of knowledge. And so let's just take a few minutes and nothing, I mean nothing real deep, but let's talk about the blood and see why it is only through the blood, the shed blood of the Lamb of God that we are who we are, that we're part of what we are, and this is the only way that we're going to make it. Uh, or you could say this is the only way. Matthew 10, 22 says, He who endures to the end... Or I suppose we could say he who endures to the, the, uh, the supper of the lamb, the, the marriage supper of the lamb. He who endures to the end, or when you take your last breath physically. Are you still on fire for Jesus? You know, you received the Lord 20 years ago. Where are you now? Are you still excited about him or are you out back out in the world? He who endures to the end. When you get saved, when you get born again, that's just the start of your walk. Now, are you going to stay committed to Jesus? Is he going to be Lord of your life? Is the word going to be first place in your life for the next 20, 30, 40 years until you take your last breath? That's going to determine whether you make it or not. There's people that won't make it to the end. You know, they'll get down the road probably. I know of people, you know, that went down the road several years and all of a sudden we didn't see them anymore. Back in the world, big time. Nothing to do with God, nothing to do with the church. They didn't endure to the end. And I know some personally I know exactly where they're going. They're going straight to hell. And they used to preach the same message as we preach right now. But they're gone. Sin, back into sin, back into the world where they want nothing to do with God. They didn't endure to the end. So it's only through the blood that we're going to make it. Matter of fact, you know, I come back here to Hebrews and, you know, in some ways I... 
you know, I really admire you folks with all the Hebrew and Arabic and Greek that's going on around here. And uh, I'm sorry to say I'm still having trouble with English. But the greater one that abides within me, he's a master with the Hebrew and the Arabic and the Greek. So I'm just trusting him to help me keep it as straight as you folks got it going. <laughs> so anyway, Hebrews 13 and 20. Now, may the God of peace who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep through the blood, say the blood, blood. of the everlasting covenant. Now, it's through the blood of the Lamb of God, the blood of Jesus, that we can go on to verse 21, will make you complete in every good work to do His will, working in you what is well, pleasing in His sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. So it's through the blood, the shed blood of Lord Jesus Christ, through the everlasting covenant. Of course, the new blood covenant was cut uh, uh, between God the Father and the Lord Jesus through the blood of Jesus. All right. Now, let's just back up a little bit and see how this all goes. You know, in, the, in uh, Titus and chapter 1 and in verse 2, and I'm going to read it out of the Amplif Amplified Bible, and it reads this way, Resting in the hope of eternal life, life which the ever-truthful God, who cannot deceive, promised before the world or the ages of time began. God can't lie. This is what he promised, right? And so he promised this uh, eternal life before this whole universe or this earth was ever created. Amen. Because the true, only true living God that we serve, the one that's created the heavens and the earth, like it says in Jeremiah 10, 10 to 13, he's the only true living God who's created the heavens and the earth. And it goes on to say, and all other such gods who have not created the heavens and the earth shall be destroyed. Yeah. Period. Mm -hmm. There's only one that's created the heavens and the earth. And so, he know, and he's also the God that knows the beginning from the end. He's all present, all powerful. He knows everything. He knows what's going to happen, you know, a thousand years down the road. Or in this case, when he created man, he already knew what Jesus was going to do 4,000 years down the road. He knows everything. Yes. Now, before he even created this world and us, he had already had purposed in his heart that we'd be created in his own image and likeness. And consequently, we would also be given a free will. Because God has a free will. And he desired family. But he didn't desire robots. He desired a family that would love him, worship him, want to walk with him, spend eternity with him, because they wanted to. You know, it's just, it, it, you know, we, we say that we're, the church is the bride and Jesus is the bridegroom. He compares it in the scriptures, you know, to a husband and wife, like in Ephesians 5, for example. Well, you know... I, I, you know, we're no different than God in one sense. I, I like to have a wife that's not a robot. <laughs> and she wants to walk with me because she wants to. Yeah. And she really loves me from her heart. I don't have, she doesn't have to say it because she might be afraid I might beat up on her if she doesn't say I love you. No, it's from her heart. And so the relationship is very similar. God wants a bride that loves him because we want to. So he's given us the choice. But he knew then, he knew the beginning from then, he knew what would happen. And of course it was, it, uh, it was very clear, you know, when God created Adam and gave him a free will, that his will would be tested. And you go back, of course, to Genesis, to the book of beginnings, and you pick it up here in verse, uh, chapter 2 rather, and verse 16. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat of it, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. And, of course, that's talking about spiritual death, which is the worst kind of death you and I could ever experience. The Bible talks about three deaths, really, physical death, spiritual death, and the second death, where everything's poured in. The second death is where everything's poured into the lake of fire back there in Revelation. But spiritual death, as you know in this congregation, I'm a spirit. I'm just clothed with flesh. And when, I take my, when my flesh takes its last breath physically, the body will drop, but immediately I'll be in the presence of the Lord. I just continue living. I don't miss a lick. I, as a human spirit, I don't miss a lick. Just keep living. We could say a lot of things about that too, but not right now. But anyway, so when we're spiritually dead, we have the nature of sin, we cannot come into the presence of God. Isaiah 59, 2 tells us that we are sins separate us from God. So, God knew that man would rebel and be separated from him. Now you've got to understand God desired family, obviously. Uh, 
not that he had a need for family because he's always existed without us. <laughs> and one of the big words we use with God, he's transcendent, which means he does, he's not dependent upon his creation for his existence. But he desired a family. That's obvious when we look at the scriptures. And uh, so he knew then that man wouldn't be able to save himself because the penalty for sin is spiritual death. And of course, then he ordained before the beginning of time, like we saw here in Titus 1 and 2, and we can see in the scriptures that what he had ordained was that there was only going to be one way to be reconciled back to him, for man to be reconciled back to him, and that would be through the shed blood of a substitutionary innocent sacrifice. That was the only way that we'd be able to come back to God. Now, of course, he also knew man was the one that sinned. Man was the one that's going to have to pay the death penalty. But as far as some uh, a man, <laughs> there was no man <laughs> that had innocent blood, that was sinless, that could step in and pay the death penalty for the rest of us. There wasn't any. And so God is holy and sinless. And so there is God, there is the justice side or the judgment side of God, and then there's the holiness side of God. Now God is love. But now God as love and holy and sinless, of course, he wants to embrace us. He loves us, <laughs> wants to bless us, wants to fellowship with us. But then the judgment side of God says, you can't do it. You can't do it. Sin has to be punished. Sin has to be punished before <laughs> you, you, you can embrace man. And of course, then uh, otherwise, if God ignored sin and overlooked it, he would become unholy. So sin has to be punished for God to maintain his holiness and be sinless. He couldn't just stand by and watch the creation be destroyed. And that's what would happen. Sin would spread like cancer and destroy his creation. And, the and you could say, on the other hand, that the love of God compels him to protect his creation and sin has to be punished. But there's this holiness side and the judgment side of God. And so then, God then, as we all know, he then offered up himself. He said, I will, take on, I will take on the form of a human being. As a sinless, I'll have, I'll be uh, uh, just like the first Adam, sinless. The second Adam, which would be Jesus, God's son, would take on the form of a human being and literally pay the death penalty for mankind. Yeah. I think it's pretty interesting because uh, when we look then at uh, Genesis 3.15, it talks, uh, he announces his plan of salvation, of course. And he says that the seed of the woman, that would be capital S, singular, talking about the virgin birth, would uh, bruise the head of Satan. And in the Oriental language, that means destroying the lordship of a ruler. But isn't it interesting that 4,000 years later, he shows up. <laughs> and of course, he, he bruised the head of Satan. He stripped him of all power and authority. It says in Revelation 1.18, I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I'm alive forevermore. And I have the keys of Hades and of death. Glory be to God. So that was God's plan. But you know, it took a little time to get there. And uh, so he announces his plan of salvation back there in Genesis. And then we, we see that uh, through the Old Testament, of course, we know that it was the shed blood of animals that would cover man's sins and make it possible for him you know, to draw near to God. Of course, there was, he was in the Holy of Holies, that, you know, all this thing with the priest was the only one that would go in there once a year, as I understand it. But he could not live inside of human beings because we couldn't be born again. The death penalty hadn't been paid for our sins. So uh, we, we could not become the living temples which would happen under the new blood covenant. But you look at Genesis 3.21, we can see the first evidence of shed blood, blood of an animal, that... Uh, covered Adam and Eve because it tells us that Adam and Eve were clothed with the skins of animals. So an animal was killed. And that's in seed form. We see all of that. So there's a lot of things you could, you could get out of that. It looks to me like Adam and Eve must have been told about the gospel because remember in Genesis 3, 8, it says the gospel was preached to Abraham beforehand. Well, where did Abraham get it from? Well, Abraham and Noah were still alive at the same time. Abel and Cain, where did they get it from? They must have got it from their parents. There must have, it's just my, I'm just uh, interjecting, this is my opinion right now, because there's not a scripture that says it. But when you look at them clothed with the skins of animals, there was bloodshed to obviously cover them. 
So it, it, it really looks like Adam and Eve must have repented. I don't know. Maybe you got the answer to that, but I'm just Revelation speculating. 13, eight. Hmm? Revelation 13.8. There it is. Okay. 13.8. I'll have to remember that. Revelation 13. Well, let me look at it right now. And uh, Revelation 13 and 8. Revelation 13 and verse 8. All who dwell on the earth will worship him whose names have not been written in the book of life, uh, in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. All right. You want to say any more about it? Well, that, that was, uh, we preached on that during Yom Kippur. Mm -hmm. And that was the understanding that Adam had, a, the understanding that there was a sacrifice that had happened before to establish who he was. We were created out of that sacrifice, and that is not, this, not the blood, but the spiritual blood of that sacrifice of the Lamb that was created. We were created independent of all other creations. That's what, how God made us. Okay. All right. Good. Well, I'll keep meditating on that one. <laughs> <laughs> so that was the evidence of the first blood that was shed. And then, of course, we go on. We could go to Exodus 12, you know, the Passover, which you're all familiar with. But then ultimately, I want to work my way over to the new blood covenant uh, because of the time that we have. But the apostle, or rather John the Baptist, over here in, in John, uh, John chapter 1, the gospel of John chapter 1, and in verse 20, 29, the next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Amen. And then in verse 30. Uh, Five, again the next day John stood with two of his disciples and looking at Jesus as he walked he said behold the Lamb of God now in Leviticus 17 and 11 it says uh, the life of the flesh is in the blood and I've given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls for it's the blood that makes atonement for your souls now the altar of the cross the blood that was offered up in the altar of the cross we see in Hebrews 10 and 5 Jesus said, you have prepared a body for me. Well, Jesus came into this world literally in the form of a human being. And I, uh, I'll go back here to Hebrews chapter 2. And in verse, uh, well, I probably should pick it up in Philippians first. And uh, Philippians chapter 2. And I'll get here in a second. And uh, let me pick it up down here. In verse 5. Let this mind be in you as was also in Christ Jesus and being in the form of God did not consider robbery to be equal with God and made himself of no reputation taking on the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And so in verse 17 of Hebrews 2 in the Amplified it says so it is evident that it was essential that he be made like his brethren in every respect in order that he might become a merciful, sympathetic, and faithful high priest in the things related to make atonement and propitiation for the people's sins. For because he himself in his humanity has suffered in being tempted, tested, and tried, he is able immediately to run to the cry of assist, relieve those who are being tempted and tested and tried and who therefore are being exposed to suffering. So he took on literally the form of a human being. He had to be born into this world just like the rest of us. And in this case, it came through the Virgin Mary. And when I look back here at Luke chapter 2 and pick it up here in verse 40, and the child Jesus grew and became strong in spirit. Now, if he'd have come as God, he already would have been strong. But he came literally as a human being. Filled with wisdom and the grace of God was upon him. In verse 52 of Luke 2. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God. He increased in wisdom. He grew in the things of God. And of course, uh, he not only... Well, first of all, he had a body like ours. Because Romans 8 verse 3 said that he had the same sinful flesh that we had. So he was tempted in all points even as we were. I say that because that's what the Bible says. But isn't it interesting? I thought this was interesting. Uh, we love him because he first loved us. But when we come back here to James, and uh, James has something to say about God in verse 13. Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he'll receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, 
I am tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. Now God can't be tempted. In other words, the devil couldn't, never could touch God. God is holy, he's sinless, and he can't be tempted. So in other words, he'll never sin. But now, Jesus is being tempted. Jesus is now, has t or God has taken on the form of a man, and now as a man, he can be tempted. Now what, are the, what has he done? He now has opened himself up to be tempted by the devil. These are real temptations. Now he, just like you and I, have to resist that temptation. Now in his case, as a man, he's going to have to resist every temptation and make it to the cross sinless. But now as a man, he could miss it. He could. You know, when we look at Matthew 26, I believe, I'll, let me get back here. Uh, Matthew 26, and he's in the garden. Uh, I mean, uh, yeah, the garden of Gethsemane. And in verse 38, uh, I guess that would be, and of Matthew 26, Amplified Bible, and he said to them, my soul is very sad and deeply grieved that I'm almost dying of sorrow. Stay here and keep awake and keep watch with me. And going a little further, he threw himself upon the ground on his face and was prayed saying, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass away from me. Now a cup can either be a symbol of life and health or death and evil. In this case, it's death and evil because we know what's going to happen the next day, tomorrow. He who knew no sin, 2 Corinthians 5, 21, he who knew no sin would be made sin for us so that we might become the righteous of God in Christ Jesus. So here it comes. And that's not the physical thing that's got him going. You know, that's going to be terrible enough. He already, he's, he, you know, with all the crucifixion and the death of the physical body. But it was interesting in Hebrews, again, in chapter, well, let me see. I believe it's chapter 5. And I come right down here to, in the Amplified Bible, to the last half or last portion of verse 7. Uh, first of all, it starts off in the days of his flesh, Hebrews 5, 7. And then it goes on and says certain things. But then it, towards the end it says, in that he shrank from the horrors of separation from the bright presence of the Father. Now that's what's going on back here in Matthew 26. Because he knows what's going to happen tomorrow. He's going to be made sin. He's going to take on our sins. And I thought it was interesting, you know, as you look at this, and I don't think you can find this in the, in the, in the Gospels, uh, at least. But in, you know that Psalms 22 talks about Jesus, or the crucifixion, quite a bit of detail. And, of course, it starts off, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Which we recognize from the Gospels. But I look at verse 3 and it says, But you are holy. Now what we're seeing here is, I believe is where we, our sins are coming upon him. And now he is becoming unholy. And he's talking about God who is holy. He's taking this whole thing on. But the point I was trying to make back here, he had, you know, when we're tempted... The thought can come, but as long as we cast it down, we haven't sinned. Now, the thought came here, if it's your will, you know, may this, uh, well, see, if it's impossible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, immediately cast that down. Not what I will, not what I desire, but as you will and desire. I trust you. I'm going forward with it. Now, to me, you know, I read the scriptures, He's, he had the three temptations in Matthew we always talk about. But now he was tempted every day just like you and I are. He had the same flesh according to Romans 8.3. Yeah. But here was the biggie. Mm -hmm. and, but praise God he stayed wow. steadfast. <laughs> he, yeah. You know, he, uh, he was full of the word. And you know, in Luke 24... And in verse 44, 45, he says the books of, uh, the books of Moses and uh, the Psalms and the prophets all speak concerning me. And, of course, here we see Psalms 22 talks about him. But, you know, his key was the same, I believe, as the Apostle Paul. Jesus said this. Psalms 119 is talking about Jesus. And you get down to verse 97. Here he is speaking. He says, oh, how I love your law or your word or your truth. It is my meditation all the day. 
So he literally did Joshua 1 8 as a good Jewish man, where it says, This book of the word of the law shall not depart from the mouth, thou shalt meditate there and day and night, that thou mayest observe to do or to understand all that is written therein, for then thou shalt make thy way uh, prosperous and be successful. And so Jesus ended up having a prosperous walk or a successful walk in that he was able to me meditate on the word day and night. He obeyed the word of God. He did it. And he was able to do it all the way to the cross and be successful in fulfilling what his purpose was on this earth. Amen. But it was all through the word. Amen. So, praise God. Anyway, a little side trip. But anyway, we're back to, I started to talk about the altar at the cross. So, he said in Hebrews 10, 5, you've given me a, uh, a body. Well, now in that body was the blood of Jesus. Now, when we look at Acts 20, 28, it said God purchased the church with his own blood. And of course, the Mary, Virgin Mary was conceived of the Holy Ghost. Scientists have proven the blood comes from the male, not from the woman. Mm -hmm. So Mary provided the body for Jesus. The blood came from God. So the blood that was offered up on the cross was the blood of the creator of this universe. Mm -hmm. yep. So when you, and it's, a, it's the blood of the holy, sinless, almighty God was offered up in that blood. Almighty, of course, all powerful. Nobody any more powerful than God. His life, the life that created everything that exists mm -hmm. was in that blood. And that shed blood paid in full the death penalty for our sins. That redemptive blood of the new blood covenant. Now that word redemptive, you know, includes a lot of things. Now, when I was introduced to the gospel in April of 1972, of course I don't didn't understand everything then, like I do, I understand it a little bit better now. But really, when they shared that God so loved the world, the Son, His only begotten Son, who has lived, shall not perish, and that Jesus had had gone to the cross and, you know, shed his blood for us and paid for the death penalty for me. And then I made a decision to ask him into my heart along with my wife. Now, when I did that, you know, Romans 10, 8, if you'll confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that he's raised from the dead, then thou shalt be saved or born again or regenerated. Or like it says in Colossians 1, 13, you'll be taken from the power of darkness and translated in the kingdom of the son of his love and uh, as a born again, regenerated human spirit. Now, unknown to me, he had already paid the ransom price. I was a slave. Romans chapter 6, 15 to 23 tells me that I was a slave to sin and a slave to Satan and a slave of death. And then, of course, I got born again. It goes on to say in Romans 6, 15 to 23, they obeyed the gospel, born again, and now became slaves of righteousness, slaves to do what's right. When I was a slave of sin, I was a slave to do what was wrong. And so... The shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ then paid the ransom price for me as a slave. Mark 10, 45, 1 Timothy 2, 6 talks about Jesus paying the ransom price. And really, for you and I, the highest price ever paid to set a slave free happened at the cross when the life of the creator of this universe was given to pay the death penalty for my sins. Amen. The ransom price. So unknown to me, when I asked the Lord to come into my heart, that the chains of slavery had already fallen off. The prison doors of darkness, the powers of darkness was open. And so the Holy Spirit then just simply transferred me from the kingdom of Satan or the power of darkness into the kingdom of his son of love as a born again, regenerated human spirit. Remember Jesus said to Nicodemus in John 3, 3, except one be born again, cannot see the kingdom of God. So, I, and in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. I became a brand new creation, born again. And as a new creation, or like it says, a brand new species that never existed before, I didn't have a past. My sins were remitted. No way you could confess your sins that you had for 29 years walking on this earth, they were simply remitted. The old gym was gone. Amen. And now it was a brand new gym, a brand new creation, a brand new species that never existed before, all because of the shed blood of the Lamb of God. Now, not only that, when we're born again, it says in Ephesians 4 and 24, we're created in righteousness and holiness. Yes. And so when you look then at 1 Corinthians and chapter 3, 
and verse 16 it's I'll start with verse yeah, 16 do you not know first Corinthians 3 16 that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you if anyone defiles the temple of God God will destroy him for the temple of God is holy which temple you are so we are holy temples for a holy God and it just amazes me that when I tell people that we were created holy I'm talking about word people now at one time it was righteousness <laughs> you know he'd stand up and say I'm righteous I have right standing with God just like I've never done anything wrong and I'll never forget that little old lady in Montana Assemblies of God Church, she comes up to me afterwards with that bony finger in my face and said, how dare you stand up and say that you are righteous and be so arrogant. <laughs> well, I said, I'm only saying what the word says. <laughs> I was made righteous. I have right standing with God like I've never done anything wrong. Well, then the same thing happened. All of a sudden, we're talking about holiness. And Matthew 12, 14 says, without holiness, no one will see God. Right. Well, then here we find out we're created holy. Well, obviously, we have to be a holy temple if a holy God is going to live inside of us. So we become living temples for God to live inside of all through the shed blood of the Lamb of God through the new blood covenant. Amen. Now, when we look at the new blood covenant, and uh, you, are, you, you all understand covenant, so real basic, real basic, that it has to be cut between two individuals and both of them have a need. So real basically, man had a need to be redeemed and Jesus took on the form of a man. God the Father had a desire for family, but he also needed a physical body in this physical dimension to, accomplish or to fulfill his plan of salvation for mankind. He needed somebody to preach it. <laughs> and so, first of all, the covenant then was cut between God and the God-man Jesus. That's who it was cut with. Those two. We, uh, we see a type and shadow of that really. In, in Genesis 15. Remember God had Abraham cut the, uh, uh, the animals in half. And lay them all out. And then of course. Uh, you know there would be then the two individuals. That walked through the bloody halves. Well before he had a chance to do that. He's laid aside. You know I, I, I looked at that there in Genesis 15. And, um, oh, let's see. Uh, when the sun was going down, verse 12, Genesis 15, when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abraham, and behold, horror and great darkness fell upon him. And I talked about, of course, their, their, the, the years that they would be in Egypt. But then it comes down to verse 17, and it came to pass, while this, when the sun went down, it was dark, that behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a burning torch that passed between these, those pieces. He saw two individuals walking through those halves. And of course, one would be God the Father, the smoking oven. The other one would be the lamp, the torch, whatever your translation is, represents Christ and the church. So here's God the Son and God the Father. This is before God the Son took on the form of a human being, had a physical body. But this, is a, uh, this covenant is really a foreshadowing of what was going to happen way down the road when the new blood covenant was cut. We can see the shadow of that cross, God the Father and the God-man Jesus comes all the way back to here. But now it's being fulfilled up there. But now God the Son has taken on the form of a human being. And this covenant, the new blood covenant, the better covenant, established upon better promises. Because now through the new blood covenant we can become the living temples for God to live inside of. It goes all the way there and comes back this way. Isn't that something? How God does that. And so it's fulfilled. All right, now, as, uh, now we then, of course, in this new blood covenant, Everything God is and ever will be and has and ever will have belongs to Jesus 100% unconditionally. And likewise, everything that Jesus is and ever will be and has and ever will have belongs to God the Father unconditionally. That's just the way, that's the real simple, the simplest way I can put it. That's the way it was cut with the Hebrew men too. Uh, it's just the same way it worked. Now, you and I, it's conditional. We have a free will. We can choose to continue on our path to hell or we can recognize what Jesus did. And like I said earlier, at Romans 10, 8, we can then confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in our heart he's raised from the dead, pay the death penalty for us and so forth, and be born again. And become part of the body of Jesus Christ. It's up to us, the choices. But if we choose to receive Jesus and we're born again, then we become part of the body of Jesus. 
Now remember, everything that Jesus has and ever will have. Well, 2,000 years after he shed his blood at Calvary's cross, Kathleen and I and many others all over the world, we joined, we became part of the body of Christ. Now, Kathleen and I now belong to the Father through Jesus Christ. Because everything Jesus is and has belongs to God, the Father. Well, that simply means then that everything I am and ever will be and have and ever will have now belongs to God through Amen. Jesus. Amen. It's all about Jesus. If I'd have had my way in 1964, I already would have been in hell for over 50 years. But then I finally was delivered from darkness <laughs> when I asked him to come into my heart and I was born again. And so now it's all about Jesus. I have no other reason to live. Amen. The world has no, I have no interest in the world. The devil has nothing in me. And through the blood of Jesus, I just re, when I do sin, I repent and he forgives and cleanses me like I've never done anything wrong so that I can have that intimate fellowship with him. Praise the Lord. All right, so then, likewise now, everything God the Father is and has, he's made available to me through Jesus because I'm a joint heir with Jesus Christ, Romans 8, 17. So really then, we, you and I are operating with unlimited resources because now God the Father is our covenant partner through Jesus. Through Jesus. And you know, in Psalms 50 and 12 and Psalms 24 and 1, it says the earth and the world and the fullness thereof belongs to God. Haggai 2, 8, all the gold and silver belongs to God. And then Psalms 50, verse 10, the beasts and the forest and the cattle on a thousand hills. God owns everything and all that he's created. He owns it all. Satan is just the God of the world system. But God owns everything in the earth and the fullness thereof. And not only in this world, <laughs> but you, you know, when you looked at Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8 in the Amplified Bible, uh, we come into, we want to talk, oh boy, I'm getting away ahead of myself. But you know, in Colossians 1.13 it says, He has enabled us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints. He's qualified us. Partakers of the inheritance of the saints. Jesus is our inheritance. God is our inheritance. Now, when God's your inheritance, guess what? Everything he is and has is now available to you. Everything. Supernatural protection and provision. Everything. And things you don't even know you need down the road, it's, to, it's already there. But in Ephesians, that's where I was going, here's what we inherit, you know, and we look at earthly thing, and that's the worst thing we could do. In Ephesians 2, 8 and the Amplified, listen to this. To me, though I am the very least of all the saints, God's consecrated people, this grace, favor, privilege, was granted and graciously entrusted to proclaim to the Gentiles the unending, boundless, fathomless, incalculable, and exhaustless riches of Christ, wealth which no human being could have searched out. In other words, you can take all the wealth of this earth, all the billionaires, trillionaires, whatever, put it all together, and it's just a drop in the bucket to compare to what lies ahead for us. When it says in Corinthians, Jesus became poor that we could become rich, he left that unfathomable, incalculable wealth came into this physical dimension. And I don't care, you can have all the oil fields in the world and everything, it's poverty next to what's waiting for us on the other side. Glory. Well, anyway. I don't know where I was trucking with all this stuff. But anyway. Uh, <laughs> so we become living temples of God now uh, you know let me go back just for a second this is not really good but I need to go back just a bit you know where Jesus was tempted in the garden of Gethsemane yep. now God is not a man that he should lie Proverbs 23 19 so obviously when he became a man he could break his word he's a man now and it came very close there in the garden of Gethsemane but now think about this. This is what God did for us. He's so, he, we love him because he first loved us. He was willing to take, in my words, you know, take the chance. Right. He exposed himself to Satan when he became a man. Right. And be tempted just like you and I are. Right. Now should he have waved, you know, said, look, I'm not going through with this in the Garden of Gethsemane. Or committed or yielded to any temptation and sinned. Immediately he would have broken his word as a man. And he would have ceased being God. He would have ceased being holy. And everything would have fallen apart. Because when you look at Hebrews, he holds everything together with the word of his power. Propels the universe and everything. Now all of a sudden that would be gone. Everything would fall apart. He was willing to do that. For you and me. In other words, 
He was willing to lose everything if that's what it took rather than live without us. You know, and it's interesting, you know, we all love God. And, and like I said last night, I, I was so happy to get born again at age 29 and find out that Christianity is not a religion. Yeah. It's not a denomination. Right. It's not a group of churches like AFCM. It's having a personal relationship with a, with a true, with a God that's alive and then created everything. And he lives inside of us. And he wants us, like the Apostle Paul said in Philippians 3 and 10, the Amplified Bible, my predetermined purpose is to get to know him intimately. That's what it's all about. He wants us to get to know him intimately. That's why he went to the cross. That's the main reason he went to the cross, to restore, to, to be reconciled back to him and have that fellowship with him. Now, folks, I'm telling you, if we're going to make it through what's ahead for us and make it like the prophets did, you know, prophet Isaiah tradition tells us was sawed in half. We look at all of the apostles except one that were martyred in different ways. The Apostle Paul, even in 2 Timothy, when he said, my time of departure is at hand, in, in verse 6, and he said, my, I fought the good fight, I finished the course, I kept, I kept the faith, I remained loyal and faithful to Jesus. And then he was beheaded. Yeah. Tradition says he was beheaded by Nero. Mm -hmm. now, isn't it interesting? Nero was the king. One evil man feeding all the Christians to lions and all that stuff that he did. But the Apostle Paul said in 1 Timothy 2, pray for the leaders placed above you. <sighs> well, he's praying for Nero. That's a bad president. <laughs> <laughs> but what really hits home there's not one line recorded where he criticized Nero. But pray for the man that ultimately would behead him. Anyway, just a thought. <laughs> I think it's keeping us, you know, it's good to keep your heart clean so you don't even get into strife with the leadership. <laughs> Stay clean, pray, walk in love, trust God. <laughs> because, you know, when you look in the Old Testament, he'd even use unsaved kings. To accomplish his will. That's right. That's right. So who am I? You know, thank God we can pray in tongues. <laughs> I know we're praying the way we're supposed to be praying. <laughs> I'm probably like you. I'm praying for this country not to fall as long as the church is here and all of this. But the truth is, I don't know everything. But I pray for what I believe is the best, <laughs> and then just go in tongues and with the Holy Ghost just kind of keep this thing going in the right direction. All right, now, through the blood of the Lord Jesus, we see in Hebrews 10 and 19, we can enter the holiest. But now here's something else about the blood. Not only does it remit our sins, but when we as believers now sin, according to 1 John 1, 9, well, I'll read the whole chapter, 1 John chapter 1. But when you get to verse 9, if we confess our sins, of course, if you're going to confess the sin, that means you have already determined to repent and not do it again with God's help. As you know, as believers, we can sin. But we don't, it's not our nature to sin. We don't practice sin habitually. We've been delivered from all of that. But he knew we would sin. And not that we want to, but there are times when, we, when it just happens. And if we're quick to repent, he not only forgives us, but he cleanses us from all unrighteousness. Now, when you look at that, we come, I'll come back here to Hebrews again, and I'll pick it up here in verse 9 and verse 14. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit, offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? And then, of course, it goes on in chapter 10, talks about all the animal sacrifices which they offered up every year. And none of those sacrifices remove the consciousness of sin in verse 2 of Hebrews 10. There's continually offering up sacrifices. But then in verse 22 of chapter 10, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our heart sprinkled or purified or cleansed from an evil conscience. Now, what's an evil conscience? A sin consciousness. And our bodies washed with pure water. So here we have the blood of Jesus. Now by faith we believe we receive forgiveness. 
But how many times after we thank God for forgiving us, these thoughts keep coming to our mind. I can't believe I was so stupid. I can't believe I did that. I can't believe I thought that. I can't believe I said that. Did God really forgive me? You know, you got this battle going on. But now by faith, we thank God that through the power that's in the shed blood of the Lamb of God, that the cleansing blood of Jesus cleanses my conscience from sin consciousness, from failure, from condemnation, from guilt, from inferiority. Why? And now that enables me, now I've come into the holiest through the blood of Jesus, but now as I allow the blood of Jesus to cleanse my conscience, there's nothing between me and God that prevents me from getting to know him intimately because of the cleansing blood of Jesus. Amen. Well, we also know that the blood of Jesus then, uh, we already said that, paid the death penalty for uh, uh, not only our sins, but it set us free from the power of sin. We see that when Jesus in Matthew 28, he said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore unto all nations, baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them all things I've commanded, Lord, with you, even to the end of this age. And then Ephesians 1.21 says, and even not only this age, but that which is to come. It's the everlasting covenant. And, um, oh, where was I going with that one? <laughs> but, um, uh, oh, it'll come back to me here. I just got to thinking about something else and I shouldn't have done that. All right, but anyway, uh, yeah, the devil. And so then, he, uh, he gave us the authority, which I already said in Revelation 1.18, I'm, I was dead, I'm, I'm alive, I was dead, and behold, I'm alive, everyone have the keys of Hades and death. That was 68 AD, that was 68 years after the death of Christ. Mm -hmm. But now we understand he gave us that, he got the, the strip Satan of all power and authority, gave that authority to us. So these signs shall follow them to believe in Mark 16.17, they, my name, they shall cast out devils, the ones who have been given all authority. And then in Matthew 18, 18, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And then even his disciples, you know, before they were still on the earth, he said, I give you power, authority to trample upon serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing by any means shall harm you. Then James 4, 7 says, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. Well, when you're submitted to God and God's in you, and his power is flowing through you. Yeah. And he's the, God, he's the father of lights, James 1, 17. I tell you, I just declared that the light of God shines brightly in my life, causing darkness to flee from before me as if in terror. And then finally, they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony or the word of their confession. Right. And so then, you can then, like it says in Philippians 2, you can take the name of Jesus because in Philippians 2 and verse 8, and being found in the appearance of a man, he became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Verse 9. And therefore God also highly exalted him and given him the name, which is above every name. Verse 10. That is the name of Jesus. Every knee shall bow of those in heaven, those on the earth, and those under the earth. And verse 11. And every tongue confessed that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. Praise God. All right. So then you can go and, you, and see in our position, we're seated in heavenly places with Christ. So I always look down when I'm talking to the devil. And I say, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I continue to resist you. The Bible says you flee as of in terror. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I bind you, Satan, and all forces of darkness. And I hold you bound under my feet in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And I declare that a paralyzed enemy cannot stop. Kathleen and I and, and, the, and AFSM International Worldwide from fulfilling in its fullness what God's called us to do. All through the power that's in the shed blood of the Lamb that was all made available. Isn't that incredible? We need to exercise that authority. And I do, and, and not just once, not, don't just exercise that when all hell breaks loose. Stay on top of it. There's nothing wrong with, you know, continuously start. I, I worship the Lord in the morning like the rest of you do. But there's a point when I get to it. When I do exercise that authority, I remind him that I'm holding him bound 24-7, 365 days a year. He's under my feet. Yes. Now, we're in blood covenant with God, right? Yes. All right, so then, this is, uh, I'll take you back here to, well, Isaiah 55 and 11. God says, so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return unto me void. But it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing that I sent it. Now, when we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6, uh, uh, and now we're t uh, you know, we've been talking about blood covenant, 
And now you can see the blood covenant, uh, our description of it, I guess, or another term. Because listen to this, because we said everything I am and have belongs to God and vice versa. And 1 Corinthians 6, 19, or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? See? Everything I have and am belongs to God. And then in verse 20, for you were bought at a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So I'm a human spirit, I belong to him totally, and my physical body does too. So that means my hands belong to God, my physical hands, my feet. You know, which it says in, in Romans chapter 10 talks about the, 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 the preaching of the gospel and how the, the glad tidings, you know, and the feet. And then, of course, my mouth belongs to God. Yeah. My tongue belongs to God. So thank God for revelation knowledge, the spirit of wisdom, revelation, the knowledge of God. So that what? We will speak death and not life. Death and life's in the power of the tongue. Proverbs 18, 21. So now that we belong to God and our body belongs to him, we need to make sure that we're speaking life, which means agreeing with God's word in every area of life. And as we do, and I pray, Lord, I, I thank you, Holy Spirit, for giving me redemptive revelation, the spirit of wisdom revelation. I trust you giving me the words to, as I pray so that my tongue is your tongue, that my words are your words. And then Psalms 103, 20. We are singing about the mighty angels last night. Psalms 103 verse 20 says, Bless the Lord, you his angels, who excel in strength, who do his word, heeding the voice of his word. So then I just declare that all the forces of heaven are free to move freely. All of heaven. In order to, to enable me to walk in the fullness of the new blood covenant so I can accomplish in its fullness God's purpose for my life. Not mine, but God's purpose. And I believe that all the forces, the angels have, whatever it takes, are heeding the voice of God and seeing to it and helping us to fulfill what God has called us to do. Now in Ephesians 3, it gets it pretty straight. I got it open here in the Amplified Bible. You know, in verse 16, another one of the Pauline prayers, and uh, I'll open it here, I'll just, uh, for a little quicker, I'll do the New King James. It says here in verse 16 that we are to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, verse 17, that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints whether width and length and depth and height to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge. Now, as you, uh, as you do these things and you're walking in them, then he says that you may be filled with the fullness of God. And you know, I just, I just uh, boldly, peace be unto this man over here. <laughs> You know, if you're not careful, you're going to get excited. <laughs> you know, we just need to get bold with the things of God. God, you need to, you need to check your heart. You know, and I looked at this and says, Lord, I'm, I, I believe I'm strengthened. I can't do anything in my own strength. And I'm counting on you, Holy Spirit, your strength and your ability. Christ does dwell in my heart by faith. I'm rooted and grounded in love. With your help, I do my best to walk in love at all times and what have you. And I believe I'm filled with the fullness of God. Yes, now, verse 20. Yes. Now to him is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us. The Holy Spirit can work in us if we meet yeah. these conditions here. And we should have no problem meeting because he's going to help us do it. It goes back to our heart. And he says, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory. Uh, who is able to above all parts, according to the power. But then when you look at the Amplified Bible, you see this in addition to that. It says in verse 20 in the Amplified Bible, it says, now to him who by consequence of the action of his power, that is at work within us, is able to carry out his purpose. Say his purpose. his purpose. And do super abundantly, far and above all the good ask into behind his prayers and our hopes. God has made available everything he is and has, infinite provision to accomplish his purpose. I think Pastor put it last night this way we got ministers building their own kingdom. No, that's not what it's for. It's to build his kingdom. So there, you don't no sense believe in God for infinite provision if you're just heaping it up for yourself. Yes, that's right. It's not going to work. But I've got to tell you that there are other spirits out there that would be more than happy to accommodate you. Yeah. 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 And their wealth comes with a hook in it. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. And we want the real thing. Oh, yes. So make sure 
Make sure you, we have to examine our hearts at all times and know that we can't do anything in our own power and ability. Everything we have in our, whether it's ministry or personal, it's all because of him. And it's to accomplish his purpose. Amen. Well, we better try to wrap this up somehow. But we know that in Isaiah 4 and 5, Matthew 8, 17, 1 Peter 2, 24, through his shed blood, we've been healed. Physically. And so, you can come before the Lord and say, thank you, Lord. Kathleen and I, you healed us 2,000 years ago when you shed your blood. We were healed. And therefore, I declare that we both have sound minds and the spirit the natural. We have perfect memory recall and the spirit the natural. We have perfect eyesight and the spirit the natural. Perfect hearing and the spirit the natural. And every cell, every organ, every tissue, every muscle, every bone, every joint of our being is healed and whole. So that we can accomplish in its fullness what you've called us to do. I believe with all my heart that at Calvary's cross when you provided healing for us. It was so that we could walk in divine health and fulfill in its fullness what you've called us to do. And I believe if you tarry long enough. If we have to live to be 100 years old. We'll, found, we'll be found preaching the gospel in divine health and supernatural strength. And I do. <laughs> Hallelujah. Glory be to God. And that's all true. That's, that's all through his wounds or shed blood. So, I better close it right here. <laughs> While we still can. <laughs> that they overcame him. They overcame him by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. You know, just the final thought, hopefully it's the final thought. <laughs> Think about this. We're, physical, we're spirits living in physical bodies. The physical body cannot live without water. I think it's 70% or more made up of water. And then without water, the toxins can't be flushed out of our system. If they're not flushed out, we're in trouble. It'll shorten up the life expectancy of your physical body really quick. Water is so important. But you know, as water is to the physical body, so is blood to the human spirit. Because without the blood we would still be dead in our trespasses. But through the blood, and for, according to Ephesians 2, verse 1 through 5 and 6, we have been made alive. We were dead, and now we've been made alive. And without the blood, there'd be no remission or forgiveness or cleansing. And the cleansing blood of Jesus cleanses us from all unrighteousness. And if you look at uh, Leviticus in the first five, seven chapters, you find out that even Known and unknown sins are cleansed. Because there's things that, there's sins we commit we're not even aware of. Uh, I mean, like uh, driving over the speed limit. You didn't see the sign that went from 35 to 25 or 20 until you came back going the other way. Oh my God, I didn't realize that it was that low or slow. There's things we commit unconsciously. But the blood continually flushes that toxin, so to speak, out of the human spirit to keep us where we can have that intimate fellowship with God. Of course, once we're aware of it, according to Leviticus, then we're guilty. Then it's just a matter of repenting. I'm sorry, Lord, I, that one got right by me. I'm sorry. With your help, we won't do that again. And you know, people would say, well, you're practicing sin consciousness. No, I'm practicing righteousness consciousness. Right. My desire is to walk in righteousness. So I even tell the Holy Spirit, I even share with him, Lord, if there's any sin in my life that for some reason I've missed it somewhere and I don't even not aware of it, please do whatever you have to do to bring it to my remembrance so that I can repent, receive forgiveness, and cleansing. Amen. That's righteousness consciousness. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> All right, Father, we thank you for your word. It's so packed full of life. There's so much. We just thank and appreciate you, Lord. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for helping us this morning to have even a better appreciation for what you've done for us through your shed blood. And we just bless you for it and thank you for it. We're so thankful that we're on the winning team. We know how it all ends. And no matter what goes on in this physical dimension, you have a purpose for each and every one of us. And I declare that we all will fulfill that purpose. As we near, when our body takes the last breath, we'll be able to hear you say, Jesus, you've done everything I've asked you to do. Well done. And I thank you for that, Father. And we can do that not in our own strength, but in your strength, your ability, Holy Spirit. We are and we will fulfill everything you've called us to do and I bless you for it in Jesus name Amen Amen, Amen. Amen.